Well, now turn with me to um, the two scriptures listed on the order of service today, Luke 24 and Acts chapter 1. Luke 24, Acts chapter 1. My heart is loaded today, so be ready for whatever might come. It may not be on your order of service there. It may not be on your study guide, but we'll try to make it up to you if you need something along the way. Now, we're going to talk about today that we're continuing our sermon series on the church as a pillar of the ground of truth and uh, in these next two sermons, I want to address what I think and what many people think to be the most neglected doctrine of the church today, and that is the person of the Holy Spirit. It was interesting that you sang the song, Holy, 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 with a lot of gusto, but on the last song, it was kind of low, which means we don't talk about, we don't sing about, we don't think about the Holy Spirit as often as we do about God and about Jesus Christ. Not condemning you or criticizing, it's just an observation. Now, according to the report from the Pew Research Center that came out just this week, we published this report in the Watchman's Report, and if we don't have any copies of that, maybe we can pick up some. 28% of those Americans describe their particular religion as none or as unaffiliated. What does that mean? Well, some say that they're atheists, they're agnostics, they don't believe in God, they don't believe in church, they're just not involved in anybody's religion because they don't believe in God or they don't believe God is who the Bible says He is. They don't trust any organized religion or because of a negative experience that they've had with religious people, not only in churches but primarily in their homes with their parents, the, hip the hypocrisy of their parents. I'm telling you folks, Kids will listen to what you say, but they will practice what you do. And the Apostle Paul was very clear about that. Whatever you've heard and seen in me, put these into practice, and the God of peace will be with you. So that 28% of nuns means they may have been attached to a church or some religion at one time, but no more. They're, not, they're unaffiliated. Now what brought me to tears, literally, when I read the report was this. It's an in-depth report of, by, um, I believe her name is, Nia Segal, I apologize if I mispronounced it, <clears throat> she's vice president of the Pew Research Center, and evidently she did some deep dive digging into those numbers, and here's what she said. Hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people, are disillusioned with churches and pastors who have abandoned the Bible. People are dying for authenticity and craving for community, but many churches are infected with theological liberalism, we don't need to dress up the gospel with light shows and rock bands. There is something unique about the gospel, and I think a lot of people are ready to hear the gospel and respond to it if the church would present the gospel with love and grace. Amen, amen. And if uh, Neha Segal, if you're listening to this or get word of this, I'll buy you the finest lunch at Waffle House any day of the week because you said what exactly what I've been saying for the last 50 years. And now, Tony, the words have come in. As many of you know, this has been my appeal for the last 30 years. It's been my cry in the wilderness, but nobody would hear me. Nobody would pay attention because they were too interested in church growth. Well, here's the report card. And the very things that contemporary churches leaders, the, the, the things that contemporary church leaders abandoned and got rid of, not to offend the unsaved, sound doctrine, biblical preaching, authentic models of the Christian faith, that's what the unsaved want to see and to hear. And, and, and that's what they need. And again, well, we can correct it going forward. I understand that. But what in the world do we do with all those who've been misled for the last 30 years? Now, a few are coming back, and some of you have been in churches where uh, there, the gospel was cheapened and the worship service was an entertainment. And I appreciate the fact that you finally found a home here. But my point is, what do you do with those who are still involved in that, who still think they're being blinded by the theater of religion? Beloved, while the church may address the felt needs of the people, and we do that as much as we can, they're certainly, they're certainly mentioned all throughout the Scriptures, the primary task of the church, therefore, is to be the pillar and the ground of the doctrine to the Christian faith. That's our primary purpose. In previous sermons, we've covered the authority, the inerrancy, the infallibility, and the sufficiency of Scripture. For unless we start right there with the Bible to be God's holy word, truth with no mixture of error in its content or its intent, especially regarding matters of faith and the practice of our faith, all of the doctrines also lose their credibility. If you don't start with the Bible as the authentic word of God, how do you develop authentic doctrines? 
We have no other pathway to eternal life. If you abandon the Bible, you have no other pathway to eternal life. The Bible de declares God the Father as the creator and sustainer of everything that exists on the earth, okay? We believe God exists in one, as one God in essence, and, but he manifests himself in three unique, distinct personages, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, the three in one. And unless we can accept and believe his triune nature, we are, in effect, negating the deity of Christ. And when you negate the deity of Christ, you've given up your hope of any salvation. Uh, it nullifies him as our Savior. It uh, nullifies him as our Lord. We have, uh, we're just going to die in our sins, and, and that the graveyard is the end of it all. If you, you see where we're going with this. Over the last two Sundays, we have looked at the deity of Christ. He was the only God-man, totally God, yet totally man, God himself housed in the human flesh of a Jewish man. He had to be a man to die a physical death on the cross, but he had to be God for his death to pay the penalty for the sins of those who would believe in him as their Savior and Lord. So, and beloved, there's no such thing as a divided Christ in the New Testament. If he's Savior, he's Lord. If he's not Lord, he's not your Savior. You can't have one or the other. Let me again quote C.S. Lewis. Jesus was either Lord, liar, or lunatic. And if he wasn't truly Lord, he could not have been our Savior. He was just a man who showed up at the wrong time and got crucified. Oh, how pitiful that is. No, that's not the gospel. That he was God in the flesh dying for the sins of mortal man. Again, it is imperative that we accept the Bible as the Word of God, that it accurately describes the person and the power of God, the Father, as well as the person and the work of God the Son, Jesus. For our confession of faith is predicated upon the truth of the Holy Scriptures. You must start right there. However, the same holds true for the person of the Holy Spirit, the third part of that triune God. For apart from the work of the Holy Spirit, none of us would be saved. Do you understand that? Were it not for the work of the Holy Spirit in us and to us and through us and with us, we would not be here today. Now, one of the most beloved hymns is that which we sang this morning, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord God Almighty, perfect in harmony, Blessed Trinity. Well, Christians like to sing that song, and you sang it very well today. We, talk, we don't mind singing about the triunity of God, but if I were to ask you to raise your hands, don't do this. I know some of you are willing to do it, but don't do it. Do you understand the triune nature of God? It would probably be, no, I really don't. I've been in the church 45 years, but I really still don't know the triune nature of God. Well, been there, done that. You see, we can accept the concept of God the Father, can't we? Because um, we see the creation of the world. We know that everything had to be a creator. We see a designer. We see the design, so therefore there must be a designer. We know that God is that uncaused cause behind everything that exists. He brought everything that exists out of nothing. And we read Genesis, in beginning God, and so therefore we know our minds focus upon the person we call God the Father. He is the Father of everything. They can accept, we can accept the concept of God the Son, for even the secular historians agree that there was a man named Jesus who claimed to be the very Son of God, who lived among us for 33 years, gave his life on the cross, saying he was the Savior sent from God. So we have evidence to prove that. In fact, uh, Chuck Cozen and others said there's more evidence to prove that Jesus Christ lived on the earth than Abraham Lincoln served as president. But that doesn't mean anything. Jesus claimed his death on the cross was payment for our sins. And uh, he claimed that his resurrection proved that his death was uh, sufficient for all who would believe in him. So when they read John 3, 16, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, our mind goes to the Son of God, to Jesus, uh, who declared himself to be the Savior of the world. However, when it comes to the Holy Spirit, it's a little bit different, isn't it? It's more difficult for us to comprehend. And you know why? Here's why. 1 Corinthians 3. The Apostle Paul said this, The natural man, the, the man that does not know the Lord at all, does not accept the things of the Spirit of God. If he did, he would not be unsaved. If you believed in the Holy Spirit, if you received the Holy Spirit, he would not be unsaved. For they are foolishness to the unsaved. Therefore, the unsaved cannot understand them because they are spiritually appraised. What did Jesus tell Nicodemus? I can't discuss these things with you because you're not yet born again. You know the Bible like the back of your hand, but you don't know the Holy Spirit. Christians haven't been born again. In other words, many of you claim to be Christians today who have not been born again, I don't want to shatter your future, 
But if you've not been born again by the Holy Spirit, if you've not had a transform transformative experience with the Holy Spirit, there's a possibility that you're still not saved. You understand that? Because the process of salvation, as we're learning on Wednesday night, the call, the, uh, the regeneration, our conversion experience, our justification, our sanctification, uh, all our preservation, our hope of any glorification, folks, all that is the work of the Holy Spirit. God the Father planned it, God the Son carried it out, but God the Holy Spirit is making sure it works out. And He's the power that will get us through. So here's the problem. Most preachers do not preach on the Holy Spirit. Most preachers don't preach on the Holy Spirit because, well, all the people can't understand that. Well, no, they'll never understand it. Do you preach it, preacher? But the problem is the preachers are the ones who don't understand it because they were not taught the Trinitarian concept of God in their seminary classes if they have a class on the Holy Spirit at all. You might have had a, uh, a class on the doctrine of God, which includes the triune nature, but after an uh, you know, hour or two class a week on that, what else are we going to learn? See, therefore, most of the information then, for the last 50 years at least, regarding the work of the Holy Spirit, has come to us from the Pentecostal movement, the dominations that kind of put, uh, push one facet of the work of the Holy Spirit to the extreme, and quite frankly, uh, their hyper-emotionalism kind of scares people off. The fact is, some of what they call the manifestations of the Holy Spirit are just not true to Scripture. And sadly, many people have rejected the concept of the Holy Spirit because it looks phony, it looks cheap, it looks, uh, well, it's, it's just phony, like the plastic fruit bowls on the table. You know my story about that. And I often wonder why in the world mom would put plastic fruit on the, on the table. It's no good to anybody. Well, that's the phony belief, a phony belief of the Holy Spirit. Now, we can thank God that many of those hyper-Pentecostal movements that sprang up near the end of the last century are no longer. They've ceased. What does that prove? That proves they were of man, not of God. For if they were of God, they would continue. But we need to be careful because as, as weak as the church is today, boy, what we need now is just another phony revival. And we've seen part of that in recent days. Now, because of our lack of spiritual understanding of the Holy Spirit, many Christians refer to the Holy Spirit as an it, rather than a third person, a co-equal, co-eternal, and co-existent expression of the triune God. In 1611, when uh, King James authorized the translation of the Bible that many of us carry around today, the King James Bible, the term Holy Ghost was used in that uh, translation. And, but the word Holy Ghost in that day meant a living spirit. Well, today the term ghost means the spirit of a dead person. Uh, and that, and again, that causes some people to be afraid of the work of the Holy Spirit. So I got this ghost walking around me all, or in me, all, uh, hovering around me all the time. No, he's a spirit, but he's not a ghost. So with that lack of training, lack of education, that lack of truth, that lack of proper translation, and outright fear of the Holy Spirit, there's a lack of certainty regarding the triunity of God and especially on the work of the Holy Spirit. However, from the very first chapter of Genesis, God revealed himself to us as one God manifested in three distinct expressions with a united purpose, and that was to redeem lost man from his sins. They all work together. They all have their part. But to deny the triune nature of God is to deny the incarnation. If you, dry, if you deny the incarnation of God, then you don't have a purpose for our salvation, and you have no hope for the future. You understand that. So if you can't understand or deny the triune nature of God, you're, just, you're disqualifying the incarnation of Christ. Now let's review these three persons one more time, probably for the last time, so that you get the difference and the unity. God the Father was the Ancient of Days. He is the planner, the designer, the creator. He is the initiator of all things. Not only of the universe and all that's in it, but he's also the initiator of our plan of salvation. God so loved that he did something about it. Well, he's also our Redeemer. Just as God the Father called and sent Moses to deliver his people from their slavery in Egypt, God sent Jesus Christ to be our Savior, which means God the Father is the initiator of our salvation. And even Jesus said, no one can come to him uh, unless the Father who sent him drew them to him. You didn't just, can't just wake up and say, I don't think I'll join the Christian faith. You can do it, but it's worthless. No one can come to the Father unless the Holy Spirit draws them. To accommodate other religions, though, in the last few years, uh, religions that have no respect for the Bible, no respect for our, our relationship with God, and to appease these radical feminists who shudder every time they have to 
address God as their father, as some male figure. They can't handle that. Many churches, many denominations now, uh, are changing their translations and their readings, uh, not using the word God as a father, but they'll use the term God or Lord in a non-gender specific term. Do you understand what that does? It nullifies the fact that he is God the Father, the initiator of all things. However, to deny that, to reject, to reject the fatherhood of God, is to deny who God says he is. And in fact, you're calling God a liar. He said he's father. You, you're going to argue with that? I, don't, I know who's going to win that argument. It makes God a liar. It, it destroys the example of fatherhood that God established for all men. And boy, do we need that again today. How about God the Son? Well, God the Son, God, God the Son is God's physical presence throughout, uh, throughout the Bible. He's always the physical presence of God on the earth. When there's the physical manifestation of God, it's always in the form of God the Son, but not necessarily a Jesus of Nazareth. We'll get to that later. John 1.18. No man has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, the one ever being in the bosom of the Father, he has declared him. So anytime there's a physical manifestation of God in the Old Testament, it is always the second nature of God, the Son of God, who literally became the Savior of the world through Jesus Christ. Hebrews 1.1, 1, 1, God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers in the prophets, in many portions, in many ways, in these last days, has spoken to us through his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds. Now, Jesus is God's Son in that he was conceived in Mary's womb by the Holy Spirit. We understand that. We worship that. We say that every Christmas. And uh, let me give you the text on that. The angel said to Mary, The Holy Spirit will come upon you. The power of the Most High will overshadow you, so that Holy One to be born within you will be called the Son of God. Now, again, you can argue with that, but I don't know who's going to win the argument. Jesus' name in Hebrew was Yeshua, or we, sound, we pronounce it Joshua. Uh, it meant Savior. Joshua means Savior. Yeshua means Savior. Uh, and Christ comes from the Greek word Christos, which means the anointed one or the sent one. So Jesus' last name is not Christ. <laughs> Jesus Christ is one of the same name. Jesus means he's Savior and Lord. You can't separate the two. There's no division between the two. Jesus was a Savior sent from God, and he is Lord. Now we come to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit <coughs> is the expression, the express power of God, the express power of God. Um, in Genesis 1, 2, And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the earth, uh, the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Now in Acts chapter 2, Peter quoted the prophecy of Joel, In the last days it shall come to pass, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. I will pour out my power upon all flesh. Now, God has already revealed his triune nature in other ways. Just kind of listen to this. The number three, for example. The number three denotes divinity or completeness. A third line would always complete two. You can take two lines, draw a third line, it completes it. Uh, there are three natures in the universe, space, time, and matter. Three great divisions of time, past, present, and future. Three concepts of human capability, their thought, word, and deed. Three natures of man, body, soul, and spirit. It was on the third day of creation that the earth was um, caused to rise up out of the waters. <laughs> uh, our Lord's ministry on the earth, the prophet, priest, and king, lasted for three years. He proved himself to be the good shepherd, the great shepherd, and the chief shepherd. He raised three people from the dead, only three. He was crucified on the third hour. He was resurrected on the third day. Y'all got enough of this? I could go on and on and on. So God revealed his triune nature in many different ways throughout the Bible. Uh, the light has three rays. There is the heat ray, which is felt but not seen, a uh, picture of God the Father. There is the light ray, which is seen but not felt. That's the picture of God the Son. And there is the actinic or chemical ray, which can neither be seen nor felt, but whose presence is revealed by his actions. For example, in photography, uh, that's an X-ray, if you will, of, of light, a picture of the power of the unseen Holy Spirit transforming us 
into the image of Jesus Christ. So if you've been born again right now, then you have dwelling within you a portion of the Holy Spirit, and His purpose is to clean you up and make you a holy temple uh, in which He can uh, deposit uh, gifts and powers and strengths, and He can use you to bring glory to God throughout the world. So we don't see the Spirit, but we, we can sure sense the Spirit, working the effects of the Spirit in our life. You walk out in the world and you see something that you know is a sin, that it's temptations to you, and the Spirit says, nope, nope, you don't want to do that. That's the evidence of the work of the Holy Spirit in your life. Now, let me ask you a question as we get into this this morning. What is in your heart right now regarding the Holy Spirit? What is in your heart and mind? What are you thinking right now about the Holy Spirit? Let me ask you some questions. If there was a searching in your heart and your soul right now for a deeper, more intimate fellowship with God the Father, who do you think put that desire there? That's the work, that's the evidence of the Holy Spirit. Showing you there isn't anything in this world that will satisfy the hunger in your soul apart from your personal relationship with God himself. You can go as long as you want to, buy all the things that you can buy, you can build bigger, better, whatever. It, nothing will ever satisfy until you come to have that personal relationship with God through the Holy Spirit. Is there a longing for God's wisdom regarding some crucial issues in your life? You want God's answers for what you're going through. Or maybe the issues we're facing in the world right now. If there's a longing for God's wisdom regarding all these things, that's the evidence of the work of the Holy Spirit within you. Trying to guide you into all truth. Letting you see that the answers you're searching for cannot be found in any word to the world. Not at all. No matter how profound they are, they cannot, they cannot even come anywhere near the truth and the wisdom of the Word of God. Why? Because the Word of God deals with everything that has been and everything it will be. It's all in one. It's, oh, oh, it's, it's complete knowledge of the past, present, and the future. Now, if there's the desire within it, you to live above the temptations of the world, man, I'd love to get rid of this sin. I'd love to conquer the sin that so easily besets me. I'd love to rise them up a little bit of all the temptations. That are, if that's there today, that's the evidence of the work of the Holy Spirit in your life. Now, let me ask you another question. What if there is no hunger in your soul for that deeper intimacy with God? Well, I know God. He's just a good old fellow up there. He's a holy grandfather. What if there's no longing for God's wisdom? What if you don't desire victory over that sin that so easily besets you? The short answer is you haven't been born again. And therefore, you're not saved. You, must, you may have gone through all the steps of becoming a member of a local church, but folks, if you've, you've been adopted into the family, you don't have those fears and wants and desires. You belong to God. He belongs to you. So what if that hunger is not there? When a person is born again, the Holy Spirit indwells that person with a holy presence, and holy presence is always there. You can, as we talk about later, you can grieve him, you can strive him, you can, you can resist him, but he's there. And his assignment is to do whatever needs to be done to clean us up and to conform us into the image of Christ, to put us back on that mold and to shape us in the form he needs us to be, and then to equip us for the work he wants us to do. I wonder how much work is not being done because you will not allow the Holy Spirit to equip you to do it. Even more importantly, to, be perf to perfect us and to polish our lives. Yes, to perfect us and to polish our lives, to make us holy rollers if he has to, so that we can be a greater reflection of God's glory to those who need to see the glory of God today and then to see it in us. And he can use us to draw others to see their need for a Savior, Jesus Christ as a Savior to need. And you know what? They may ask us, well, can you tell me, for the, can you give me a reason for the hope that is within you? That's the Holy Spirit. So if we would allow him full access to every area of our lives, I mean, every area now, not those that we want to hold on, but every area, uh, and give him freedom to do whatever he needs to do, he can take the filthiest, vile vessel that even smells of the smoke of hell, and he can clean that up to be one of the most radiant reflectors of God's glory. And many of you could testify to that. I once was blind, but now I see. I once I walked in sin, but now I walk with Christ. That's the contrast. However, here's the key. We must be willing to give him that freedom and sadly, the majority of Christians have never fully surrendered their lives unto the Lordship of Jesus Christ. They've never taken that divisive stand and that decisive stand. It's divisive, all right, but it's decisive against their sinful desires and put God first in their lives in every area. They have one foot in the church, one foot in the world. They're of no use to either one. 
They want the blessings of God upon themselves and their family. Oh, but no, we can't surrender the leadership of our lives unto the Lordship of Jesus Christ. We really want to decide how we live our Christian life. Well, it's not your life to live. It's a life that's been given to you by God. They'll try to bargain with God by giving up a few surface sins here and there, but never the root sins, or they'll whine to God, well, God, that's, you're just going to have to accept me like him because that's the best I can be. No, it's not. No, it is not. It's what you have allowed yourself to be. It's what you've limited yourself to be. Beloved, I want to ask you a question. Is that an adequate expression of the gratitude for what God has done for us through Jesus Christ? Let me give you the adequate expression. Romans 12, 1 and 2. Paul told those he had led to confession of their faith in Christ. Listen. <clears throat> the only appropriate and sufficient response that we can make to God for what he has done for us is to give our unconditional surrender to the Lordship of Christ in our lives. Everything lock, stock, and barrel, from, from the head to the toe. Every, Romans 12, 1 and 2. Listen to it carefully. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies like you would present your offering, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, not dead sacrifice, but live for Christ, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. It's the least you can do. And do not then be conformed uh, to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Now, Paul had written 11 chapters on what God had done for us through Jesus Christ to fulfill his plan for our redemption, to redeem us from our sins. But then, in these two verses of chapter 12, Paul said the only logical, reasonable response of a lost man that a lost man could have to someone who'd done so much for him was to live their lives, give their lives unto the Lordship of Christ because that's the only way they would be saved. So I'm going to ask you, have you done that? Just like you prayed to receive Christ, if you said a prayer or come forward or agreed to the gospel presentation, have you simply said, Lord, I yield my life to you. I surrender all, all to Jesus I give. Well, let's look at the promise of the Holy Spirit. Number one, pick up your Bible there, Luke chapter 24, verses 44 through 49. Look at verse 49. And behold, I send the promise of my Father to you. Go back now to that day. Jesus, just as there was a promise uh, of the coming Messiah, <clears throat> and that promise was fulfilled in the person and the work of Jesus Christ, so there was a promise of the coming of the Holy Spirit in great power, and that promise was fulfilled on the day of Pentecost. Now, i got to stop there and say, yes, the Holy Spirit had been working since Genesis 1-1. Uh, the, the Holy Spirit hovered over the face of the earth, right? So it's, it's all the way up to the New Testament. But now it's the new manifestation, a new evidence, a new method of his power. Acts chapter 1, Jesus told the disciples, you wait there in Jerusalem for what the Father had promised. So the promise was from the Father. And in verse 15, he identified that promise by telling them, John baptized you with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. <clears throat> the prophet Joel made that promise 700 years earlier, before the birth of Christ. Joel 2.28 said this, And I will come, it will come about that I will pour out my Spirit upon all flesh. And here's one of the manifestations of that. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions, and even on the male and female servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days. So there's going to be a new manifestation, a new evidence of the work of the Holy Spirit on the earth after Pentecost. Well, the prophets Isaiah and Ezekiel saw that same vision from God. There would be a definite day and a definite way that God would reveal his spirit to the world, just there was a definite day and a definite way God revealed his son to the world. Luke said the promise was fulfilled on the day of Pentecost as Jesus' disciples were there in that room, upper room and then they were empowered to preach the gospel in the various languages of the many thousands of people who were already there for the observance of Pentecost. And the Bible says as a result of that preaching about 3,000 people were saved and baptized on that one day which was the day the church began. That was the birthday of the church. If you want to go to Acts chapter 2, that's the birthday of the church. Obviously, the majority of people had, all, had no idea what was happening. And many of them thought the disciples were drunk with wine. But in Acts chapter 2, verse 14, Peter finally got the courage by the Holy Spirit to stand up 
and told them, no, no, these men aren't drunk. It's only the third hour of the day, for heaven's sake. Uh, but this is what was spoken of by the prophet Joel. Remember that a day would come when God would pour out his spirit on all flesh. Folks, this is that day. You're in the midst of it. You're in the midst of this great outpouring of the Holy Spirit, the fulfillment of the promise of God. Number two, look at um, John chapter 14, verse 16 and 17. Jesus said this. He's, be, he's meeting with his disciples there. They know that he's about to leave and they're going to feel abandoned. Here's what he said. I will pray the Father and he shall give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever. I've been with you for three years. This Holy Spirit, this new comforter who's just like me, but in a different fashion, he can be with you for eternity. And the world cannot receive him now because it seeth him not and neither knoweth him not for he dwelleth within you and he shall be with you. All right, there's the promise. Now in the Old Testament, God lived with his people. Uh, Exodus chapter 29, verse 45. And I will dwell among the children of Israel. I will be their God. But in the New Testament, God dwells in his people. 1 Corinthians 3.16. Know you not that you're the temple of God and the Spirit of God dwells in you? Know you not when you face that temptation that the Spirit of God dwells in you? Know you not that when you want to say something you should not say, do something you should not do, that the Holy Spirit is dwelling within you? The Hebrew word spirit is ruah, which is translated breath or wind. And then finally, spirit. The, the Greek word for spirit is breath, wind, and spirit. Would you believe that? So the Old Testament and the New Testament comes together. At the, whole, the Holy Spirit is that unseen substance, that unseen force that enables ordinary men and women to do extraordinary or supernatural things. They have to be empowered and enable, they're already indwelt, but they have to be empowered and enabled by the Holy Spirit. So throughout the Bible, when people saw how that supernatural force was used for good, they called it holy. And that came the term the Holy Spirit. So you see, the Holy Spirit never draws attention to itself. The Holy Spirit only draws attention to Christ. See, that's the purpose of the Holy Spirit is not to draw attention to, Christ, uh, to us, but to Christ. His purpose is to draw attention to the power of God through whatever he uses, because he is also coexistent, co-equal, and co-eternal. So from Genesis 1-1 to Revelation 22, the Holy Spirit is actively involved in God's plan for man's redemptions, but he does it in a different manifestation according to the age. Throughout the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit came upon men who did a great work for God. You can name them Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, uh, David, of course, all the prophets. But the Holy Spirit gave some in wisdom and skill beyond their natural abilities. Did Moses? Moses said, um, I, 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 I stutter when I speak, speak. And God says, okay, I'm going to send the Holy Spirit to calm your mouth. How about, how about David? How about Joshua? We could go on. They were all were human beings. They had human limitations. But when you put them together with the Holy Spirit, they became powerful God. Moses, what you got in your hand? I, this is my staff, God. This is what I control the sheep. Lay it down, Moses. And when he laid it down, he became a snake. He said, that's what, <laughs> that's what your, look, your life looks like from heaven, that snake. Now pick it back up. You want to pick the snake up? Yeah, pick it back up. And by the tail, Moses, you want to pick it up by the tail? Yeah, pick it up. And when he started to pick it up, it became the rod of God. And this is where we are. If you'll lay your life down, it will become a snake. You'll, all the sins will be evident. But when you, when you allow the Holy Spirit to pick you back up, it will be a man of God, a woman of God. We haven't had that teaching. We haven't had that teaching in 100 years. You heard something that hasn't been taught in 100 years. The Holy Spirit gave some power to do supernatural things. The Holy Spirit revealed to some men the divine truth about the future, those prophets, how, God's, how this whole thing is going to end. It's already there. Just read the Bible. It's already there. In the New Testament, the real purpose of the Holy Spirit was revealed. He was the agent of God and the immaculate conception of our Savior. He was the, uh, uh, he was the visible manifestation of God's power in the form of that dove that came down and rested upon the shoulder of Jesus there at his baptism. Mm. He was the agent of God in that 40 days and nights to keep Jesus from cowering down to Satan. He gave him the power over the temptations. He was the agent of God's consolation in preparing Jesus for his earthly ministry. 
everywhere you went. Jesus admitted this, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Now, wait a minute, here is God the Son who's co-equal with God the Father and God the Spirit. Why would he call on the power of the Holy Spirit? Because he knew that. He was both God and man. He said, the Spirit of the Lord is already upon me, enabling him to do the works the Father had sent him to do. And the people saw those mighty works of feeding and healing and raising the dead. He had to do that through the power of the Holy Spirit. Jesus told Nicodemus, if a man wanted to be saved, he had to be born again by the Holy Spirit. Jesus went to the cross in the eternal spirit and said the writer of Hebrews, he was raised from the dead according to the spirit of holiness. Paul records that in the book of Romans. Perhaps you didn't know that. The Holy Spirit raised Jesus from the dead. Jesus sent the disciples out in the power of the Holy Spirit. And the entire book of Acts records the works of the Holy Spirit in the lives of those who believed in him for the first hundred years. Peter said it was the Holy Spirit who moved the hearts and the pens of men to write the word of God. He said no man has written a, a page of scripture by his own knowledge, but they were guided by the Holy Spirit. Paul said that it's only through the power of the Holy Spirit that we can ever hope to live the victorious Christian life. Can't do it. Paul exhorted us to keep our lives clean. Why? Because our bodies are the temples of the Holy Spirit. And he challenged us to pray in the Holy Spirit. Not little simple prayers. Lord, I lay my, now I lay my down, uh, myself down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. That's okay for a trite little child's prayer. But if you want to really pray, you have to get into the Holy Spirit. Why? Because the Holy Spirit doesn't listen to our lips. It, it communicates to the Father the desires of our heart. Desires we cannot put into words. John said he was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and therefore he wrote the book of Revelation, the final events of history. And the last invitation of the Bible says, the Spirit and the bride say, come. The Spirit and the bride say, come. But as we look at the methods of the actions, we can see the Holy Spirit is not just an it, but it's a person. John's gospel alone says the Holy Spirit testifies, it reproves, it comforts, it guides. He, he guides, he strives, he helps. And then in Acts, we see the Holy Spirit can be resisted. In Ephesians, we can see he can be grieved. In Hebrews, we can see that he can be insulted. <laughs> Boy, there's a whole lot of that going on. Right? In Matthew, we can see he can be blasphemed. In John, we can see he can be received even as Christ. Would. You can receive the Holy Spirit just as you receive Christ as your Savior. Have you done that? But this person is also divine. He's the third person of the triune God. Peter declared the Holy Spirit as God when he asked Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit? Because he said, you have not lied to the men here about your property and what you gave. You've lied to God. Jesus saw the Holy Spirit as the one who would pick up the plan of redemption from where he left off. John 14, Jesus said to the disciples, I will pray the Father and he shall give you another comforter, meaning one like me, the word paraclete means just like paraclete coming alongside, one who would come alongside and empower and enable the disciples to do what they were about to be assigned to do, get the gospel to the whole world. Acts chapter 1, Luke said in his first gospel, he wrote about all the things that Jesus began to do and to teach. But in this new book, he was going to write about what the Holy Spirit continued to do and continued to teach in those who received the gospel. Number three, look at the presence of the Holy Spirit. John 14, 16, that he may abide with you how long? Forever. Jesus was limited by his physical body to a specific time and place, even though he was at all times God. But the Holy Spirit is unlimited. He can be present with all people everywhere, even at the same time. He's ever present, always present here and now. In the Old Testament, the people of God heard and obeyed the voice of God the Father, even though that voice is often heard through thunder and the voice of others. But in the Gospels, the disciples listened intently and obeyed the voice of Jesus, for they believed that they were responding to the very voice of God. From the day of Pentecost until Jesus returns, believers are under the power and the influence of the Holy Spirit. Now, how many of you, don't raise your hand and go on this, how many of you would love to hear the voice of God? Okay, raise up your Bible. That is the Word of God. And the Holy Spirit takes the written Word of God, makes it the verbal Word of God, so it's God speaking to you. Just as a message of God, the Father is in the Old Testament always pointed to the first coming of the Savior, 
which was fulfilled in Jesus Christ. So the work of the Holy Spirit today is to keep our attention on the second coming of Jesus Christ, to live in the anticipation of his, of his return. Today, the presence of the Holy Spirit is upon those who've not received Jesus Christ as their Savior. He's there. He's there as the voice of conviction, showing them their sin and warning of the judgment to come. That's what, they're supposed, that's what the Holy Spirit's to do. In fact, the only unpardonable sin is that sin of continual unbelief. That's the mountain of unbelief that we have to get over. That continual rejection of the Holy Spirit until we die. That is the only unpardonable sin is the, un, is the continual rejection of the Holy Spirit leading you to salvation through Jesus Christ. If a person continues to reject the mercy of God and the grace of God, the only thing that they will get in their, their attention is a judgment of God. And he, he may bring them to repentance through some earthly judgment, but if he does it, there will be an eternal judgment. But they got what they deserved. If that judgment comes while they're alive and they repent, so be it. If that person dies before they repent, then the judgment they face will be eternal. You know what eternal, eternal life is? It's, 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 it's life every day in the presence of God. You know what hell is? It's life every day in the absence of God. Whew. In the absence of God. A person might reject God the Father or use his name in vain. But there's still hope for that person. There's still hope for that soul if they repent of that sin and receive Christ as their Savior. A person might reject God the Son and not serve Him as Lord. Many of us walked that way for many years. But there's still hope that somehow, some way, God would, God would change our heart and draw us back home and before it's too late. Again, some of us can identify with that very readily. But when a person rejects the Holy Spirit, folks, listen to me, there will be no other voice. There will be no other voice. And therefore, there will be no other hope. Why? Well, as God said in Genesis 6, my spirit will not always strive with men. And there will come a day when the Spirit of God will change this manifestation of work here. After the rapture of the church and the restrainer is removed, things are going to change. The work of the Holy Spirit is to bring lost people to see their greatest sin is their unbelief in Christ. And Jesus Christ is their only hope of salvation. And then that Spirit begins to work in the life of that new believer through that new believer into the lives of others. That's the way it's been since Acts chapter 2. Think about it. You were to think those 11 or 12 folks, those 120 folks, and those 3,000 folks could have got the gospel to the ends of the world in 100 years? No, no, no. It was one beggar telling another beggar where to find bread. And when a person receives Jesus Christ as your Savior, the Holy Spirit indwells that person and empowers that person to share with another person what they just heard from somebody else. That's why there's no evangelism in the church today. Believers don't know how to share the gospel with one another. The Holy Spirit indwells every Christian who's died to self and fully surrendered unto the Lord. The, the Holy Spirit dedicates, he sanctifies us, he sets us apart from uh, everybody else, yet we, fought, we fight with him. Oh, I'm going to look like everybody else, I want to talk like everybody else, I want to be like everybody else, but I want to be a Christian too. Won't work, won't work. The power of the Holy Spirit, look in Galatians 5, 19 to 22. He says, the fruit of the Spirit is love. The fruit of the Spirit is love, and out of love comes all the other fruit. Every believer is indwelt by the Holy Spirit the very moment they are born again. But not every person who's born again and indwelt by the Holy Spirit is filled or empowered with the Holy Spirit. Believers are filled and empowered by the Holy Spirit when there's a work God wants that person to do. And it's always the work of God. It's not the works of man in the power of the Holy Spirit. It's the works of the Holy Spirit through the works of men. And when that person is walking in the Spirit, then the Holy Spirit will guide that person into whatever he wants that person to do. Galatians 5, 19. Paul said, these, if these things are in your life, okay, Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like. He said, if that's there, uh, I can assure you that person's life is not filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. They still may be indwelt, but they've grieved the Holy Spirit by all these different things. Um, no matter how religious they might be, they're not, in, they're not in power. But Paul goes on to say, those who practice those such things, though continue to practice those such things, will not, will not, will not inherit the kingdom of God. 
Verse 22, but if there is, quote, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control, that's the evidence that that person's life is not only indwelt by the Spirit, but it's empowered and then controlled by the Holy Spirit. We don't have to get to that point. You're indwelt, you need to be empowered, but you want to be controlled. Jesus told the disciples, wait for that power. And it came upon them, how? It came upon them like wind, and it came upon them like fire. A mighty, a mighty rushing wind, not a rushing wind, but a mighty rushing wind and tongues of fire. And when the Holy Spirit fills the life of a believer, there will be a dynamic power of God that will just rise up within you that will call you to obey Him, to serve Him, and to witness for Him. It, all you have to do is say, Lord, use me, and, and that's it. And apart from the Holy Spirit, all of our efforts to live the Christian life were in vain. That's why Jesus told even his followers to wait, wait until the Holy Spirit came upon them. Just as God said it would be through the prophet Joel, Jesus said it would be through the, of the Holy Spirit if they just wait. And Peter said the promise was for them and their children and for all who were far off. As many as the Lord shall lead to himself, and that includes us. The promise is made to us. Beloved, the Holy Spirit wants to work in you and through you into the lives of others if we just get out of the way and let him do it. Now, his first work, listen to me as we close, his first work is to call you to salvation. His first work is to call you to Jesus, to see your sin and your need for a Savior, and that Jesus Christ is a Savior you need. Now, you can resist the Holy Spirit. And how do you resist the Holy Spirit? By, not, by refusing to accept Christ as your Savior. If you've never done that, you are resisting the Holy Spirit. You can insult the Holy Spirit by failing to recognize His place in your life, His purpose and His power. Did that for 18 years. You can grieve the Holy Spirit by failing to obey whatever He tells you to do immediately. At this very moment, He's speaking to every one of you. He's saying, do this, do this, do this, and do it now. And if you refuse to do it, then you are disobeying the gift that God gave to you to keep you saved for all of eternity. Whew. You may quench the Holy Spirit by taking lightly the very truths that you've heard me preach this morning. You may walk out of here filled and overflowing with the Holy Spirit if you're willing to do what He asks you to do right now. Wait until the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Don't try to do it in the flesh. Wait. There's no magic formula here. There's no little prayer. There's no special words you have to say. The Holy Spirit enters the heart that is empty of sin and empty of self. I love this one. I wish I could quote it verbatim. The Holy Spirit enters the heart that can boast of nothing except an empty void, an aching void. Let me ask you, will you surrender your life to the Holy Spirit right now? If you're born again believer in Jesus Christ, would you just say, Lord, I, I, I just don't want, I, I want to be indwelt, but I want to be empowered, yes, to be used. But I want to be controlled right now by the Holy Spirit. Let me close with this word of testimony. I can still remember the day when I faced this decision 30, 40 something years ago. For the first time, I've faced it many other times, but the first time, the Holy Spirit been, had blessed me beyond anything Linda and I could have imagined. But we couldn't find the satisfaction of life. You know, one more little widget wouldn't do it, one more little digit wouldn't do it, nothing would do it. And. In effect, God was bringing us to the point where he showed us the emptiness of all the things in this world. It was all phony baloney, this plastic stuff. and mean that we'd never find the true meaning and purpose to life on this side of our surrender unto him. Well, then much to my surprise, after we finally said, yes, Lord, I'll go where you want me to go. I'll do what you want me to do. I'll say what you want me to say. It wasn't but about six months to a year after we said yes to the Lord that he took all of those earthly blessings away. So in the beginning, he gave us all the earthly blessings we could ever want, but without the satisfaction of them. Ready? And then, to our surprise, the first year in Bible college, he took everything away. Everything. In effect, he showed me that the fullness of life can only be found in him. The meaning of life and the fullness of life can only be found where? In the person and the power of the Holy Spirit. And ladies and gentlemen, that fresh breath of the Holy Spirit awaits our confession of our need for it. The Holy Spirit enters into the heart that can boast of nothing but an aching void. And you can fill it 
with all the Kmart, Walmart junk that you want, all the pleasures of the world, but they'll never be satisfied. All it will take to satisfy you is one more and one more and one more. How many of you can identify with that this morning? You've been there, done that. God had to take all that away in order to prove to you that when you have nothing else but him, he's enough. He's enough. Are you there? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, would you please take my rambling, stambling words this morning and make them a solid sermon in the hearts of your people. And would you do it in such a way that they know you've spoken to them, not Pastor Wayne, but the Holy Spirit has spoken through Pastor Wayne, through the Word of God, to their heart. And now they don't have to respond to Pastor Wayne. They don't have to respond to the Bible. They, hold it. they have to respond to the author of that Bible. They have to respond to the author of that Word. Speak, Lord. Have your will in your way. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. This morning.